Welcome to another moment in the Word. In your prayer life, have you ever prayed and you found yourself kind of praying perfunctorily, where you're just simply going through the routine, or have you found that you're praying, as James says, fervently? The Bible says, and James writes it, the fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. There's a sense of desperation. The word fervent is the word that means incendiary, on fire. It it has a zeal. It has a desperation. Well, that's what we see in the passage we're looking at here. A sense of real desperation on the part of two blind men. We find it is in Matthew chapter 9 and verses 27, and we're meditating down to verse 31. And when Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him and said, Jesus saith unto them, Believe you that I am able to do this? And they said unto him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes and said to them, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus strictly charged them, saying, See that you tell no man. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame throughout all the country. The context immediately, and you'll find that Matthew keeps emphasizing the conjunction and. Almost every one of his verses begins with and. And we see it here in verse 27. It's connecting. It's connecting the thought to went what before. What went before? Well, we find that this is when Jesus is leaving the home of Jairus. And Jairus had a 12-year-old daughter, and Jesus healed his daughter. She had died, remember? And Jesus raised her from the dead. And then on the way, even as he's going to Jairus' house, there were... There was this woman who was in, uh, having an issue of blood for 12 years, and, and Jesus healed her. She had just touched the hem of his garment. And, and it seemed that wherever Jesus was going, there was a sense of desperation. But I want you to see the real context. And what you have just before that is that, that Jesus had called Matthew to be his disciple. And Matthew had celebrated with a great banquet. And in that banquet, the Pharisees were there. And the Pharisees made an issue over Jesus having a dinner with the publicans, with the tax collectors, and with sinners. And then Jesus calls them, and he says, go and learn that what it says in your scriptures, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. The whole of what our Lord is calling us to is to mercy. Chesed in the Hebrew. It has the idea of giving that which is unmerited, undeserved, giving what is needed and preventing the judgment that is certainly deserved. Well, we see then Jesus is giving an illustration to these Pharisees. He's illustrating also to us in his compassion that he has for Jairus, for the the compassion he has for this woman that has an issue of blood, and the now the mercy that he has for these two blind men. And that's why, and when Jesus departed, departed from Jairus' house, he's now going to the place where he was staying, and there are two blind men, and they follow him. And the word in the, the Greek is, they continue relentlessly to follow him. How are they able to follow? They're not able to see, so they're able to follow by hearing his footsteps, by following him as he speaks, following his word. Is that what's happening in your life? Are you finding that you're blind and not knowing where to look, but you know the word of God and you're reading it and hoping that you get an understanding that you can follow him? And then we find that these two blind men not only are following Christ, but they're crying out. And the word for crying in the in the Greek is is a strong word. It means to scream, that they are 
crying out with the top of their lungs. And what are they saying? They're saying, son of David, have mercy on us. Now that word, son of David, is a term that is messianic. In other words, it is a title that is specifically referring to someone who is the Messiah, someone whom God had promised would be the anointed prophet, priest, and king, the one who would ultimately be the king of Israel. We find, therefore, in the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 1, that Jesus is identified as the son of David. We find that phrase used very seldom, actually, but it's a term that is used in reference to Jesus as Messiah. We'll find it later on in Matthew 22, where we have on the day... Palm Sunday, where the crowd is crying out, Hosanna, son of David, save us, have mercy on us. And so they're crying out, son of David. They recognize that Jesus, as the son of David, who was promised by God that from his seed would be the Messiah, would be the one who would reign over the nation of Israel from Mount Zion. And now they cry out, have mercy. Remember that we had looked earlier and seen that Jesus told the Pharisees, look in your scriptures. God requires mercy. Three things I require of thee, O man, that thou love justice, do mercy, and humble yourself before God. That you love mercy. That's the first thing that God says he requires of us. But not just mercy for ourselves, mercy for others, having compassion for others. Not just wanting there to be a restraint of judgment, but also that we would want others to not have to face the judgment that they also may deserve. And so they're crying out, have mercy on us. And so verse 28, and when so therefore Jesus came into the house. And when he came into the house, these blind men follow. They follow him as he's speaking. They're following him. And what then happens? Jesus then speaks to them. So Jesus initiates the conversation. They're crying out, have mercy, and they keep crying it out over and over again. But I remind you that you're told, ask and continue to ask, and you shall find. Seek and continue to seek, and it'll be opened up to you. Knock and continue to knock. So that is what we see here. They're not just coming once, they're coming repeatedly. Are you coming before the Lord with a sense of desperation, with a fervency in your prayer, and not just praying once, and not just praying as a perfunction, as a, as a, as a, a normal way of praying, but as a way of desperation before God? Is that what's happening in your life? And so that's what we have here. And so Jesus says, do you believe that I am able to do this? The emphasis is not on the healing. The emphasis is on believing on him. Do you believe that I am? He is the I am. He is the great healer. He is the Jehovah Rapha. He is the one that's able to restore. He's able to give sight to the blind. And so he says, do you believe that I'm able to do this? You know that it's interesting. In the Old Testament, in the Tanakh, there is not one account of anyone ever being healed of blindness. And in the New Testament, you won't find anyone being healed of blindness after the Gospels, with the exception and that is of Saul on the, on the, uh, the way to Damascus. And Jesus is the one that caused the blindness, and Jesus is the one that healed the blindness. But in every other case, all of the healings take place in the Gospels by our Lord. It's in his ministry that we see him giving sight to the blind. And what's also interesting is we find him giving sight to the blind more than any other ministry or miracle that he had performed. Now, why is that? Because blindness, it was considered to be a form of divine judgment. And it was also a very clear picture of our spiritual condition. We are blind to the things of God. 
And we find that even the evil one will blind those who do not receive the gospel, lest they should believe and be healed. And so consequently, blindness is a form of judgment. And so therefore, we find that God is the one who gives sight to the blind. And that we see in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 11. We find there when God says to Moses, who made the blind, deny not the Lord, who made the one whose speech is not uh, clear, deny not the Lord. And we also find that it's tagged with the, with, with the Messiah. The one who will give sight is not only the Lord, but the Messiah, but they're one and the same, aren't they? And so we find in Psalm 146 in verse 8, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those that are bowed down. And so it's the Lord, but also Isaiah chapter 35 and verses 5 and 6. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame leap as a deer, and the tongue of the dumb shall be uh, able to sing. And, and, and this will be when the Messiah comes, and now he has come. It is Jesus, and that's why he asked, do you believe that I can do it? And that's what I'm asking you now, as you pray, is your basis of your prayer, is it that you're looking just for the healing, or are you looking for the Savior? Are you looking for the healer? Are you looking for God himself to reveal himself to you in the extremity of your situation. And so what then happens, Jesus touches their eyes. Why does he touch their eyes? Remember I said to you that not seeing is a sign of judgment and that therefore Jesus touched our judgment. He took our judgment. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God. He touched them, and he says, according to your faith. Is faith what saves you? The answer is no. It's grace that saves you, but you are able to apprehend, to take hold of grace by faith. Without faith, you cannot please God. Without faith, you cannot be saved. It is grace that saves you, but you take that grace by faith. And so he says to them that you, by your faith, are made whole. And then Jesus says to them, and their eyes were open, and he strictly charged them, saying, see that no man know it. The word see there, very interesting. It's idon in the Greek, and it means not just to see physically, it is to see deeper, to see and with insight, and that's what God did. God wants us not only to be physically well, but also to see spiritually, to see what he wants us to see, to see as he sees, and Jesus told them not to do and, uh, and not to broadcast. What did they do? They disobeyed. Unfortunately, if we don't obey, we won't gain that insight. It's important that we find healing. It's always important to pray for those that we love and those in the world that need that healing. Absolutely. But if it's only physical healing, it's not enough. It's so important that they have insight. They have a relationship with God. They, they grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Is there a desperation as you're hearing this, as you look in your own life, as you look at the loved ones that are in your life, are you praying with fervency? Are you praying for that insight? Unfortunately, these two blind men did not obey Christ. As we see in the final verse, they spread his fame abroad. I pray you're obedient. And by being obedient, not only have you had physical blessing, but you also have spiritual blessing. Father, thank you so much for your word that changes us, your word that challenges us, your word that cleanses us, your word that empowers us, your word, Father, that convicts, and even as we speak it, it convicts us and others. We thank you, Father. Your word also converts us. And we pray if there's any listening 
whose eyes have not been opened, that they might be seeing now and having sight because your spirit has given them illumination. Your Holy Spirit has given them sight. They have received Jesus as their Savior and their Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.